Welcome to the pulpit at this time, Pastor Ryan Franklin, as he is about to deliver the word. God bless you, Pastor Ryan. Thank you, Pastor. And thank you for the opportunity and the trust to stand before this great church, this great congregation tonight. 1 Peter 5 and 8, if you have your Bibles. And thank you for weathering the storm and being here tonight. For those of you that, that uh, got here in your boat tonight, thank you for doing so. So good to see you. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. My title tonight is A Roaring Lion. A Roaring Lion. Can we pray right now? Lord, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your presence that we feel in this sanctuary right now, Lord. Anoint my mind and anoint my lips to speak and anoint this congregation to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Lions are known as the king of the jungle, right? But it's not just because of some movie or some fictitious reason. Lions have earned the title of king by being some of the most dangerous and vicious apex predators on the planet. And the lion's reputation has made it one of the most recognizable and respected and even feared animals in the entire world. And if you've ever had the opportunity to see a lion up close, you know that lions are massive. And they can weigh as much as 550 pounds. And they're loaded with muscle and power. And they have very large paws and sharp claws that they use to grip and, and literally take down their prey. And a single lion has the ability to attack and kill like no other animal because they attack with a stealthy ability. They ambush their prey. And they have the jaw power to kill with a single bite, even piercing an animal's skull. And lions are often, they often hunt in packs called a pride, which makes them even more dangerous as they wreak havoc on whatever they may attack. They work together to take down larger or faster prey. One lion will chase the prey and while the others sort of cut it off and strategically block the escape routes and and then they all gather in and they begin to rip the prey to its death. And lions also have very powerful roars which can be heard up to five miles away. Can you believe that? And they use this roar to communicate with other members of the, of the pride. And they actually establish territory based on their roar. And groups of lions will count its neighbor's roar at night to establish, to estimate the numbers and to, and to determine if it's right for them to attack the other pride. And here's what's been learned after studying lions for many years. Lions have evolved to dominate the region in which they live. They don't share it. They dominate it. And so if you've ever heard a roaring lion yourself, the lion likely was encaged and of no threat to you. But if you can imagine with me a live lion walking about in your neighborhood, and I think you could begin to, to understand the surge of adrenaline that, that, that may would come from hearing the lion roar outside of your living room window. And the absolute fear that would come over you. Maybe I'm the only one. But Simon Peter gave a very firm warning when he said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, 
as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And if you really take the time to slow down and, and process the scripture, this is a relatively scary thought. Because your adversary, the devil, he's not caged and in the safety of a zookeeper. Yet, and scripture says that he actually, he's actually walking about as a roaring lion seeking whomever he may devour. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me tell you something, folks. We don't like to think about it too much, but our enemy is real. And the enemy wants to consume you, just as lions consume their prey. You see, lions hunt from a position that they can ambush their prey, their, their prey and so they, their prey doesn't even expect it. And, and once the prey is close enough, the lion strategically pounces on it and begins to rip it to shreds. And Simon Peter is warning us that this is exactly what the devil does to believers. The devil is hidden. He disguises as an angel of light and he attacks. And he'll attack when you're ignorant of his presence. And he doesn't just attack the most fit. He actually looks for the smallest and the weakest of the options. Lions can attack anything that, that, that they want to attack. But they don't, they don't generally hunt big elephants and giraffes. Because that would take a lot of time and energy. And, and most, of, most lions are lazy. And they prey on the smaller and the weaker animals. And as I was studying yesterday, I watched a YouTube video of a lion attacking a, a pack of zebras. And, and the lion literally ran past a lar one of the large zebras to attack a younger, smaller zebra. And so guess what? The devil is going to hunt the spiritually weak as well. He's lazy. He wants that quick meal. He wants that quick win. And just as a lion will roar to instill fear, the devil tries to instill fear with persecutions and unnecessary trials and strong temptations and, and relational conversations that have gone bad. And just as a lion may leave a, a nasty mess for, for, uh, from just devouring its prey, it's amazing how big of a mess that the devil can leave in his wake when he consumes his prey. And in my 20 years of ministry, I've learned quite a few things about the tactics of the enemy. The devil and... And I've learned what a, what a roaring lion is capable of. And, and these things are subtle. They're strategic. They're sneaky. And often we don't even see them coming. And so I want to share a list of, of these sly tactics. I gleaned them from a friend of mine, Dan Rylan. But I'll share these sly tactics of the enemy in, in hopes that if I raise your level of awareness... Hopefully, you'll be able to defend yourself a little, a little better and easier if and when they come. Is that okay with you? The first one. The enemy kills our humility with self-sufficiency. Here's the deal. Blatant, unbridled pride, just a, a sheer lack of humility that's not what's going to be your downfall. That's just too obvious. The, the enemy, the enemy is, is much too smart to do that, to try something that's obvious to you. But sometimes he'll, he'll sort of come in the back door with something that maybe even, maybe even sort of feels a little positive. And this one sort of sneaks up in, in the form of, I've got this. I got this. I can do it. Now, now, this isn't the healthy version that says I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. This is the kind that just, 
that, that old independent mindset, that typical even American mindset that, that, that thinks that you can do it all by yourself. And you may even tell yourself that you need God, but, but maybe you're, you're just not using the resources that He provides, like the church and the good people of God. And self-sufficiency is a great tactic of the enemy. You see, we may get a little too confident in our own natural abilities, that, that ability or that gifting that He actually gave you. But we jockey our way into believing that that I got, I, I got this thing called life. And before you know it, we're no longer depending on Him and, re, and, and resources the way that we should. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. And so we have to be aware of, of this self-sufficiency tactic, and we have to lean into genuine genuine humility in our walk with God and, and just in our life in general. And we have to openly show a dependence on God and His resources. I stand before you nothing without Christ. Nothing without Christ. And if He doesn't get you with self-sufficiency, the old devil may swing at you with this second tactic. You ready for the second tactic? The enemy kills our joy with discouragement. And if I, were, if I were listing these in order of how prevalent they are and how common they are, I think I would list this one as number one. As a pastor, I've seen discouragement take out more church members than probably anything else, especially if it's prolonged discouragement. You see... You're most susceptible to discouragement when your perspective is off-center. And when you start thinking things like, I'm alone. Or no one cares about me. Or nothing is working out for me. Or, or I'm just not seeing things very clearly. And so the enemy gets you to begin to believe these sorts of lies, and, and the lies begin to discourage you. And in this situation, if, if you recognize that the enemy is planning these sorts of lies, one of the best things that you can do is take some time, to, take some time with someone that you trust so that they can help you begin to see things a little bit more clearly. Take some time to talk about these things and, and seek wisdom from someone who has a clear perspective. Make it a practice to look for the good that God is doing around you. And, and I, know, I, I know that we absolutely need to be honest with the reality of some of the bad things that we see around us. But there's also something good to be grateful for at any point in your life. So make some steps to begin to focus on the good to gain some encouragement so you can work on the areas that need improvement. Number three, the enemy kills our commitment with complacency. How many times do we feel the, the stress and the anxiety of the world around us and it causes us to just sort of take our foot off the gas a little bit. And we back off on, on our commitments, especially to the kingdom of God and not just serving in the kingdom of God, but we get lackadaisical in our approach to God, our prayer life, our devotion. We get complacent and we, we start rationalizing that, that that was good enough. And that eventually leads to feelings of complacency and then possibly even apathy in our life. And we find ourselves uncommitted to the kingdom of God. And it all starts with a little bit of complacency. And that's what the enemy wants. He, he, knows that, he knows that he's, not, he's probably not going to get you to quit. So he's happy to have you just sort of back up a little bit on your commitment to the kingdom of God. And that's very dangerous. And I'm not saying that being overworked or overcommitted is good by any means. But what I am saying is that you have to keep your heart engaged in the kingdom of God. Your pursuit of Him first. 
in your life. And you have to understand that it's your intimacy with God that creates that fuel that engages your commitment to the mission. You've got to remember your calling because your commitment is what's going to bring fruit. It's what's going to bring joy in your life. Number four, the enemy kills our peace with busyness. It's sort of, sort of opposite of what I, I just talked about. You see, the peace of God comes from our closeness with God, right? And it's a tremendous and it's a, it's a beautiful gift. And, and of course, the enemy doesn't want you to have that sort of peace. And so what does he do? He steals it from you while, while you work in ministry. And you're, and you're working on your job and, and, and you're working on your side job and, and you're doing the other thing that you have going on and, and then this other distraction and then you, you find yourself out of focus as you're trying to juggle a million things in your life. And here's the deal. You can't let busyness crowd out your time with God. And even your time with your family. And, and, and I, and I want to purposely say this yes even having fun along the way and we have to stay focused and, and purposeful and we have to learn to, to say no at times no is not a bad word and we have to slow down for the most important relationships in our life Dallas Willard once said what we must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives we must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. And this is not a, a one and done sort of a thing. It's a process. It's, and in, in this day and age, it's something that we have to routinely work on throughout our life. And when we figure out how to guard ourselves from the busyness of life, it's amazing the peace and the closeness that we can feel from God. Don't allow busyness to steal your peace. The last one, number five. The enemy kills our unity with division. Satan loves, he loves to try to slip in a little relational division here or there. And, and there's nothing that he would love more than a little church hurt. Some relational hurt that, that may lead to someone leaving. Or, a, God forbid, a church split. Or, or, or a competition, just maybe it's just a competition between church members, or, or, or just people not getting along and not moving the mission. And I'm so thankful that, that our pastoral team and our, and our church leadership team, we have such a great unity among us, and I'm so thankful for that. But there's nothing more that Satan would desire than to try to insert that subtle killer of division somewhere in the church. And so we have to continue to work on unity and we have to continue to work on, on, a, on a spiritual alignment and that requires intentionality and it requires good, healthy conversations. And it's amazing the way that, that life's pressure can put stress on unity and immaturity can challenge unity and, and competition threatens our unity and pride and envy, and envy it'll, it will destroy our unity and so we've got to fight for unity in the spirit and in our culture and our vision and our oneness among our church members and we've got to fight for unity in our life Amen? Amen? So that's five tactics. Five tactics that the enemy will use you. There's more. But that's five big ones. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And it's important to understand that the devil can't force you into what he wants you to do. He's roaring, he's scary, he's trying to create fear within you, but he can't impose his will on you. 
And so there's got to be an antidote to this roaring lion in our life. And, and, and we've got to give God permission in our lives to apply that antidote. Now I realize that, that we need to put on the, the armor of God. That's, that's a big deal. And, and we need to pray, obviously. And we need, we need to apply His Word. And, and we need to take, make sure that we stay in the battle and that we trust God. That's a given. Those, are th those things are, are, are given. But I'm talking about something more specific tonight that will help protect you from this roaring lion, to help protect you from these tactics of the enemy. So let's go to the, let's go to the Word again, the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 18, verse 1. It says, In the whole congregation. So this means everyone, everyone in the church. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at the shallow, at, sh at, at shallow, and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. So these Israelites, they knew how to have church. They understood how to do church. They understood the mechanics of church. They, they lived in the promised land, and, and they were having good church. Can I get an amen? amen? And so continuing on. And the land was subdued before them. So it looked like the enemy was subdued. And so from the inside of the camp, it, it looked like the enemy was taken care of. But, but as we know, he's, he's always still there. And, and he's lurking like a praying lion, seeking whom he may devour. In chapter 18, verse 2 through 3 and there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. And, and Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? Joshua 19, chapter 19, verse 51. These are the inheritance which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided for an inheritance by lot and shallow before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And so we see there that there was a door, meaning there was boundaries at the edge of their tabernacle. And so let me show you what happens when you allow the enemy to erode your boundaries and, and sort of slip into your inheritance in your tabernacle. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. And an angel of the Lord came up from, Gil from Gilgal to Bacham and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers and said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? And so you have to understand that, that leagues there in the scripture are, are, are created with spirits. And so the subtle, sneaky encroachment of the adversary will cause you to begin to tolerate spirits for so long that you just get used to them being there. And then you get to the place that, that it's actually normal for those things to be there. And they, and they sort of become, become part of the landscape of your surroundings. When it was never God's intentions for you to share your inheritance with the enemy. And here's the problem. The problem was that the, that the boundary lines were drawn by God. He gave them boundaries. But those boundaries didn't actually become Israel's boundaries. And so they never saw the importance of establishing those boundaries for themselves, for their lives. They never realized that they needed to, to say that this is mine. And devil, you can't be here. You can't have it, devil. And then Judges chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. 
And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown. So they continued to work. So it wasn't that the, that the people were lazy. They were, they were just tolerating the enemy and their inheritance. That the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth. So the, the, the children of Israel, they worked hard. But they never could seem to get ahead. And everything that they had worked for just seemed to sort of melt away before their eyes. In other words, they were living in the promised land with no increase. They, were in, they, they weren't even in Egypt anymore. They were living in a joyful place and they were living in a, a very peaceful place, but they had no increase in their place. And they had no increase in their peace. And they were living in a place that, that should be making them so happy. The promised land. Yet they had no increase in their happiness. Why was this so? Why? It was because they were, they were free from Egypt. And they were no longer having to experience that taskmaster's whip on their backs. They were, they were no longer wandering around in the wilderness. They, they even had, they had set up the holy tabernacle. You have to understand that this generation of Israelites were raised going to church. But why couldn't they get ahead in life? It was because they had not yet made God's boundaries their boundaries for their life. He had not, they had not yet made God's boundaries their own boundaries. They had not yet done what was necessary to get the enemy out of their camp. And if you truly desire to keep a, a roaring lion out of your camp, the sly and crafty and dangerous lion out of your camp, then somehow, some way, you've got to establish and maintain God's boundaries. And God established the boundaries. Everything has boundaries. The, the atmosphere has boundaries. The oceans have boundaries. Boundaries. God established the boundaries of, of the nations. And, and if you think about a river, it's the boundaries on each side of that river that makes the river flow. And without the boundaries on the left or, or, or without the boundaries on the right of that river, the river turns into a swamp. And we know all about those swamps right here in Louisiana, don't we? Those swamps grow crazy things, right? Like snakes. I hate snakes. Like alligators. Creepy things. And, and you have to understand that Jesus never said that this experience was going to be like a swamp. In fact, He did say that it would be like a river flowing out of your belly. It's not going to be a stale, stagnant, and, and creepy swamp. It's going to be like a river flowing out of your belly. And it's the boundaries that give that river its ability to flow. And I don't know about you, but I need boundaries in my life. I need boundaries for my spirit. I need boundaries for my mind. I need boundaries for my thought life. And it's amazing how those insecurities start sneaking into my life and, and I start trying to be self-sufficient. Or I allow myself to get discouraged by the things that don't really matter. Or I allow myself to get complacent in life. And I sort of take the gas off the pedal. Or the busyness of life just sort of sneaks in and it begins to distract me from the things that are most important in my life. 
And you may be the exception in the room, but, but I think most of us need boundaries from allowing ourselves to walk down these roads. I need boundaries on, on the right, those, those more conservative boundaries. And, and then I need boundaries on the left, those more liberal boundaries. And I'm not talking about politics right now. Conservative boundaries sort, sort of holds my mind from, from going in certain places, negative or, or bad places that my mind doesn't need to go. And then those liberal boundaries bring some balance to that. It gives me permission to be human because it's okay to be human. It's okay to enjoy this, this wonderful life with my family and friends. Let me give you an ex a simple example here. I've got, to give my, I've got to get myself in a prayer room every single day of my life. That's a conservative boundary. But I can't stay locked up in the prayer room 24-7 or, or I'll lose my family. That's a liberal boundary that's needed as well. And I better routinely fast, usually one day a week for me. That's a conservative boundary in my life. But I, but I can't fast every day because I'll eventually waste away. And, and, I, and I also want to enjoy some of that good gumbo occasionally. That's a liberal boundary and a needed one as well. Listen to this, Ecclesiastes 7.16. This is interesting. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? This is not saying don't be righteous. But it's saying don't be too righteous. Believe it or not. And what I hear in that scripture is not, is not a, a legalistic view of righteousness. What I hear in that scripture is, is sort of parameters. I hear boundaries. There's got to be balance in our life. And here's why. Because if you don't balance yourself, you're going to quickly burn up and burn out. And it's the continual drip of these, these little things that never seem to go away. And, and they just erode your balance and your boundaries. And, and it eventually steals your joy. And I, want, I want to encourage you tonight. Stop sharing your inheritance with the enemy. Make God's boundaries your boundaries. And he spells them out so clearly in his word. But, but make God's boundaries your boundaries. And I have to have boundaries with my emotions. Emotions are a tremendous thing. They're God-given. They're part of life for a very specific reason. They tell us a lot of, a lot of good things and, uh, and, and, and things that we need to work on even about ourselves. And, and that's... And that's also where that roaring lion attacks us the most. And we do need to be cheerful at times. That's a very important emotion, but so is anger. Anger sets boundaries and, and even causes action at, at times, but, it, but it's got to be within appropriate parameters. That particular river has to have banks to be healthy. But it can be used in good ways to, to maybe move us to pray and more and fast more and do something about situations that cause issues in our life. Passion, that's, that's another good emotion that's important. But on the flip side, so is temperance. Because there are times in your life where you just have to ignore what the enemy is fighting against you with. You may choose not to get riled up about something. Because that's exactly what he wants you to do. And these are the types of things that, that I'm talking about that are, that are boundaries. It's having balance in your life. It's not allowing those things to push you to a bad place, but using them to move through life appropriately and move through life healthily. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring Lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 
You have to understand that you have to give him permission to devour you. He may doesn't mean that he will. And if you've established boundaries in your life of how and where you'll stop the enemy from meddling in your life, then the enemy has no authority. And he has no power to steal your increase. And so the answer to the problem presented by Simon Peter in, in verse 8, that adversary, that roaring lion, the answer to your eroding boundaries, the answer is actually in the, in the previous verse. I think it's pretty funny. God seems to always have the answer before the problem even comes. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And we can take this even further by asking the question, well, how do you cast your care upon him? And again, the answer is in the previous verse. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And I would say that one of the greatest answers to determining boundaries and avoiding the enemy and learning to cast your care Upon Jesus, one of the greatest answers is to just stay humble before God. And to submit, to submit to His boundaries that He's established for us in His Word. Don't allow the adversary to sneak in and to steal your increase. And I've had the tremendous privilege to, to benefit from the inheritance of so much in this church. And you've had the tremendous privilege to benefit from the inheritance of this church and in the kingdom of God. But in order to not allow the enemy to sneak in like a roaring lion and devour the things that I have been handed, I've got to ensure that I'm holding on to those boundaries. And I've got to ensure that I'm continuing to cast my care upon him. And I've got to continue to learn to stay humble in the presence of of God. Can we all stand? And if you don't mind, can we just walk to the front as we do on a Wednesday night if you're, if you're comfortable with that? And we'll end by way of the altar tonight. And tonight... If this message is resonating with you in, in any way, I'd like for us to, to just sort of commit or, or recommit to our boundaries tonight. And, and we're going to serve notice to the enemy tonight that you can't cross that line with me. Not in my mind, not in my home, not in my family. Not in my church. Not in my city. You can't cross that line with me. 1 John 4, 4. You're of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is He that is in you. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. And if a roaring lion is, is going to get me, He's not going to tempt me with something like drugs or alcohol or, or things of that nature. That's, there's no way that, that, that I'm going to allow myself, my boundaries to be eroded with those kinds of things. But if, but if the enemy is going to get me, it's usually going to be through the insecurities of my life. My thoughts of self-sufficiency. Or the things that will create division. Or it's going to be through discouragement. Or he's going to try to steal my peace in some way. And get me to want to quit on the church. Or to quit on the people around me. Or even worse, maybe quit on God. And I'm here tonight. I want to join with you all tonight. To commit or, or, or to recommit to those boundaries in our lives. Don't allow that, that roaring 
lion to come sneaking around your life any longer. Why don't you lift your hands right now? you to just begin to talk to him. In your own words, I want you to begin to recommit your boundaries to him. Begin to recommit your mind because that's where he's going to attack you the most. Begin to recommit your families. That's it. That's it. talk to him right now. Thank you, church. Thank you, church, for recommitting right now. Thank you for recommitting your life right now. Thank you for recommitting to the boundaries of, of his word. get our minds back and focused on what's most important. Thank you, church. And there's power in, in unity. What I feel tonight is unifying, and, and there's power in that. I want you to join with, with, with someone close to you right now. Put your hand on someone's back if you don't mind, and begin to pray for them right now. Begin to pray a protection on them right now from the tactics of the enemy. That's it, church. That's unifying, church. That's unifying. You're killing discouragement right now, church. Thank you.